Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to Logarithm's webinar around building a future-ready security and monitoring strategy. My name's Jake Anthony. I'm one of the senior enterprise sales engineers here at Logarithm, and I'll be going through this webinar today, giving you an overview of my, my approach to uh, working with customers and partners on how they develop a security monitoring strategy that's going to provide them with consistent outcomes that they're looking for. Um, by way of an introduction, I've... Uh, my name's Jake Anthony. I've been at Logarithm for a little over three and a half years now. Prior to that, I spent the best part of the last decade working in SIEM managed services, uh, delivering uh, architectures and services to organizations focused on ISO 27001 compliance, as well as ITIL auditing. So just very quickly, whilst I'm going through this, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A on the right hand side. I'll look to get to as many as I can at the end of the session. And if you don't manage to catch this for whatever reason, if you have to leave, I'm, well, I really hope you don't, uh, this will be available on demand later. Just head over to the Logarithm Bright Talk page. So a very high level agenda. Um, we're gonna start with a quick summary of what the problem is uh, from a security visibility perspective. And then we're gonna go into a talk as to what the SOC visibility triad is and how that builds a great foundation for um, security monitoring for organizations of really any size. And then the big P's, Every, everyone knows the three P's, people, process, and partners, but I'm gonna go into why I believe they're important and where I believe you need to focus when you're building that security monitoring strategy. And then f finally, rounding out with a Q&A. So if we start with uh, what the problem is, so to be honest, I, I, I don't really like these slides. These slides are put, put up on every uh, webinar you ever go on, telling you just how bad the world is today, just how much cybercrime is increasing, just how much of a threat these attackers are to you on a day-to-day -day basis. But I do think it's important to flash this up, if for no other reason than to look at the little, uh, the words in purple on the right-hand side. Too many organizations are still not sitting in that mindset of if, not when. We need to be moving to that mindset of when, not if. And the reason I say that is because so many people in, in industries think they're too small or too niche to be of, uh, of potential value to people. The fact is, with things such as ransomware as a service being uh, becoming more and more readily available, all it takes is a single disgruntled employee to take down an entire business. When you think of the kind of money these people have as well, there was a, I was at a talk a few, a few months ago where we were talking about the largest ransomware as a service provider globally. And whilst their funds likely have taken a bit of a hit with a recent crypto crash, at the time, it was estimated that they had a war chest for attacking organizations of over $2 billion. That's $2 billion that they can put towards hiring hackers, developing, developing a new techniques, and infiltrating your organization to get the information that they need and want. Indeed, at the start of this year, I, I got a phone call uh, from a partner of mine to say, Jake, uh, big problem, need you on a call uh, tomorrow morning at three uh, at uh, 10 o'clock. And I said, okay, Jim, well, what's the problem? He said, I can't tell you now, but let, let's discuss it tomorrow. So we're on that call. And he explained to me that uh, one of their largest part, largest customers globally, uh, one of the subsidiaries of that customer had been hit by a ransomware attack. And um, as we got into the detail, it became really interesting to me just how much it resonates the idea of when, not if. So this ransomware attack had taken place. And um, as we were going through to the detail of it, what we found out was that whilst the ransomware attack had only triggered at the back end of January, uh, and had taken a large manufacturing facility in the UK offline, the actual infiltration had taken place over four months earlier. And as they were doing this investigation and this root cause analysis into exactly what had gone wrong, the attacker effectively had gained access through the use of a USB stick that had been dropped on the ground, someone had plugged it into an unprotected machine, and uh, the attacker had access. Now, what's really interesting is we, we know roughly that happened around the August, September timeframe. In October, there was a block on one of their external firewalls, traffic looking to go out to a known site of bad reputation. That was the first attempt of the hacker to get the information out that they needed to get out. But because it was blocked, the business said, well, we've done our job, brilliant, move on. 
The attacker stayed within the environment. And again, in November, there was another attempt to exfiltrate that was again blocked. Only when an exfiltration occurred and was successful in the middle of January, did the attacker then spring into action and take down a large portion of this organization's uh, manufacturing facilities. The, the point there is to say, if you are developing security monitoring and security prevention strategies internally in an organization, you have to be perfect every time. The attacker only has to be perfect once. So we got on a call with this partner and, and as we were talking with them and as we were talking to the customer, it became came to light that actually both us and the uh, partner were proposing exactly the same security monitoring strategy from a tooling perspective. And that was fundamentally based around the SOC visibility triad. Now, for those who don't know about the SOC visibility triad, um, it was first posited by a gentleman by the name of Anton Chivavkin. You can see the link to the blog post um, that he wrote uh, back in 2015. And the SOC visibility triad, or the nuclear triad, as he called it at that point, uh, was a simple sort of three, 400 word blog post where he talked about the idea of overlapping fields of visibility and the strength in depth, the, the strength in prevention that you get and monitoring that you get when you have defense in depth. And he said there were really three core technologies that every organization needs to have. They need to have some form of log monitoring, they need to have some form of network monitoring, and they need to have some form of endpoint monitoring. Now, unfortunately, when Anton wrote this blog post back in 2015, for a lot of organizations, that was a bit of a pipe dream. Seam was comparatively still relatively expensive. Uh, endpoint detection, well, we didn't have EDR as we know it today. Everything was based around the likes of your Kaspersky's, your McAfee's, your semantic antiviruses, which didn't deliver the value needed from an endpoint visibility perspective. And network detection and response just quite frankly didn't exist. Network traffic analytics did, and that's something that obviously Logarithm have been in the industry of for a while with, but that next generation of, of network visibility hadn't even been conceived when Anton Chivavkin wrote this blog post. The good news is we're now in a position in 2022, almost 2023 at this point, where SIEM and UEBA have become much more cost effective for organizations, whether that be deploying locally yourself or whether that be leveraging managed service providers, EDR has gone through its renaissance and there are a wide variety of fantastic uh, intelligent tools out there, the likes of Carbon Black, Microsoft Defender, CrowdStrike, Sentinel One. And NDR is going through its uh, renaissance now with um, the likes of Logarithm NDR, Darktrace, um, Vectra, all bringing different things to the table from a network visibility perspective. The point here is that we pitched this idea of the SOC visibility triad to that organization, essentially to ensure that they could be certain that were they to be potentially hit with a ransomware attack in the future, they'd see it early enough and they'd be able to stop it to reduce the potential damage. Instead of seeing tens of millions of dollars in lost revenue, they'd see a small portion of their environment taken offline before they're able to respond quickly and effectively. So let's dive just a little bit into each of the three areas. So if we start with log monitoring, what does log monitoring bring to security monitoring as a whole? Well, the, the primary thing that log monitoring does is gives you a breadth of visibility across the environment. And the reason it does that is because every technology that you deploy within your environment has the ability to generate log data and therefore that data can be pulled in to uh, your log monitoring tool set, whether that be logarithm or something else. The fact that it's ubiquitous in, in the security monitoring space means that most people already have a SIEM solution or have something akin to it, which means they're comfortable with using it, they're comfortable with what the, the capabilities of those sorts of tool sets. Being able to correlate multiple perspectives from different areas of your environment together gives you the best possible chance to spot progressions across the cyber kill chain, which is obviously a massive, uh, uh, massive uh, red flag, particularly when you look at something like the attack that I referenced earlier, where if we'd have been using these tools proactively when that attack happened, the chances are we would have spotted those November and December uh, attempted exfiltrations for what they were, which is a progression across a cyber kill chain, as opposed to an isolated incident of someone doing something uh, mistaken or, or not necessarily malicious. 
they're all it's also the primary platform for audit and um long time long dwell time investigations so as i mentioned if as you're looking back over months and months and months you're really going to be leveraging log monitoring as a storage location for that data so you can get the visibility you need and the fact is compliance organizations love a scene tool set a scene tool set is where they can where they can go when they're coming in and they're auditing you your teams click a button all of a sudden those audit requirements are met um Obviously, we all know GDPR, or ISO 27001, both of these standards absolutely require at a bare minimum a seen tool set from a security monitoring perspective. And finally, and, and I wrote this last point as a, um, it's not necessarily a log management uh, pro, to be honest with you, but log management and the seen tool sets around it can be used as a great jumping off point for orchestration and automation. Although I'm personally a big believer in the idea of having um, a vendor agnostic orchestration and automation tool layered over the top of your SOC visibility triad to essentially leverage all three technologies and pulling data from all three to then go out and perform those orchestrations and automations. But what about network monitoring? So if we say that log monitoring is about the breadth of visibility, network monitoring is all about speed. The reason for that, if you see an attack happening somewhere in your environment, that attack is going to have started at some point with some traffic having been generated on the network layer. And as a famous man once said, the network, or specifically the packets, don't lie. Um, there's a really interesting uh, conversation that I had with another partner of ours when we were talking about network monitoring. And he said he'd gone to a talk where a former director for the NSA's targeted access operations group was speaking. And that director was asked, when you're looking to infiltrate an organization, what's the most, what's the thing you're most worried about? And he actually went through the SOC visibility triad and he said, well, from an endpoint perspective, whilst endpoint detection tools are great um, for spotting a lot of, a lot of things, the fact that you're running an active um, executable on that machine means that I'll be able to find that executable and I'll know how to get around what that executable is trying to do. So I'm not overly worried about endpoint detection because if I know it's there, I can find it, I can get around it. And from a log, mon log monitoring perspective, well, I just assume people are doing logging today. So if I get onto a machine, one of the first things I'm going to do is turn off logging on that machine so that people don't necessarily see what I then do once I, once I uh, start utilizing techniques within that, within that environment. He said, the thing that worries me most from a security monitoring perspective it's a passive sensor, something that's seeing what I'm doing without me knowing that it's working. And that's where NDR comes in. NDR sits as a passive sensor on the environment to detect him and detect the activity he's doing. He was very clear and he said, if, for instance, I'm asked to I'm asked by uh, one of the three letter organizations in the US to go and find out some specific information from an Iranian nuclear facility, for instance, I'm going to try and get in to that nuclear facility and get out without being seen. It is better for me to fail to get in than it is for me to get in, get out, and then known I've been in there in the first place. So fundamentally, the fact that we're in that network monitoring is invisible to attackers just makes it fundamentally significantly more difficult to evade. New uh, style NDRs as well, when, you, when you're talking about that progression from network monitoring to network detection and response, are absolutely looking to integrate natively with things like the MITRE attack matrix to simplify your analyst's ability to threat hunt within an environment. And when I say that, I don't just mean, oh, well, here's the MITRE attack matrix. We've seen 50 multi-hot proxy style attacks in the past, two, in the past two weeks. That's where we need to focus. No, I'm, I'm talking about understanding based on the MITRE attack matrix, the kind of tactics and techniques your organization is vulnerable to, understanding where legitimate traffic is leveraging those tactics and techniques, and then looking to simplify and narrow down what those tactics and techniques are used for within your environment. Because if you, if you get rid of all the legitimate traffic that's using those TTPs, then all you're left with is potentially malicious activity. That simplifies your analyst's ability to go in and start a hunt, and once they've started that hunt, you're then just mapping against the different uh, uh, layers of the cyber kill train or the mitre attack matrix as you see your attacker move through their steps. We also, within Logarithm, look to combine 
all of that goodness that we've been using for so long within network visibility of these IDS and snort style rules with behavioral style ruling to give you visibility that's correlated and um, slimmed down to only the kind of visibility you know is actually a problem. We need to move away from this idea that because network visibility gives you so much data that we should have so many alerts to respond to within that data. We need to be being more intelligent from a machine learning perspective about the way that we use that data to pull it all together to give us a small number of high fidelity alerts. And then finally, from a network monitoring perspective, some organizations will talk to you around being in line and unencrypting traffic to be able to inspect it properly and then delivering visibility that way. I'm here to tell you that if an organization says to you that they want to unencrypt your network traffic to do network monitoring, you should run a million miles. But the fact is we are living in a world where encryption is becoming more and more prevalent and we shouldn't be shying away from that fact. We should be happy that organizations are encrypting traffic and are encrypting their, their networks appropriately. Instead, what we should be doing is developing tactics and techniques which allow us to look into that encrypted data and get as much information as we can. And that's exactly what the guys over at Salesforce did a few years ago. They, they looked at encrypted traffic and they started a process called JA3 fingerprinting. Any network monitoring tool should be absolutely leveraging this kind of tactic and technique to get visibility into that encrypted data, get enough information that you can get manageable and useful data out of it without necessarily having to unencrypt that traffic and putting the traffic itself at risk. Finally, endpoint monitoring. Now, this is obviously the one that Logarithm has the least personal um, involvement in. But if we're talking about breadth of visibility from the log monitoring layer, we're talking about speed of visibility from the network monitoring layer, endpoint monitoring is all about the depth of visibility that you can get into any single device. The reason for that being installed on the device means that you can access every single component of what is going on within that device and therefore report, monitor, uh, and respond to it effectively. The major challenge with endpoint monitoring, obviously, and, and as seen in that ransomware attack that I described at the start, is that it can't be installed on everything. And as we move to a world which has much wider attack surfaces and much more Internet of Things or black box style um, black box style deployments, you're going to be living in a world where, whilst it's great at containment and mitigation on the boxes it can be deployed on, there's going to be a proliferation of devices it cannot be deployed on. Endpoint monitoring is fantastic, though, in conjunction with network monitoring in that they actually focus rather interestingly on two separate sides of the MITRE attack matrix. So network monitoring is more closely tied to the sort of left hand side of the MITRE attack matrix and endpoint monitoring more closely focuses on the right hand side. The fact that they have different focuses means you give it getting different fields of visibility, which is giving you an insight into what's going on in your environment in ways you wouldn't otherwise expect. expect. And that last, uh, that last comment is just, again, referencing that targeted access operations director's approach of e EDR, if it's known, is very visible and very easy to get round. There are bypass techniques and disabling techniques out there that stop, that stop these th tools from working. It's even got to the point now where on the dark web, when you see people selling access to organizations, they're not just selling access credentials, they're also selling intelligence as to the kind of EDRs, the kind of logging, the kind of firewalling that these tools, these companies are using, so that when an attacker looks to infiltrate that organization, they know ahead of time exactly what they're planning to do and exactly what they're planning to uh, bypass or disable to get to that point. So that's sort of an overview of the tooling that uh, I would consider as a base foundation for any security monitoring strategy. But I'm a big believer that tooling is really just the beginning. And, and actually, the three Ps, I would argue, are probably more important. And I'm going to start with what I believe to be the most important of the three Ps, and that's process. Um, and why do, I, why do I believe this is important? Well, if you look at it at a very high level, the standard approach to deploying scene in today's world has been for the longest time, get a SIM tool in place, deploy a bunch of alarms on it, respond to those alarms as they come up. The fact is, 
if you do that today with the amount of potential attack techniques that are being used and the amount of alarms that most platforms, including Logarithm, come with, all you're going to end up with is a very, very shiny box in the corner of your environment gathering dust because you just don't have the tools and the people and the uh, processes behind those people to respond to those alarms effectively. You're going to end up with alarm fatigue and you're going to end up with people just shutting off and, and, and looking for other things to do. The first and most crucial process you have to undertake when you're looking to build a security monitoring strategy is threat modeling. What does my organization care about? Who is likely to, to be attacking my organization? What kind of tactics and techniques and threats do they, look, do they like to use? Uh, for instance, if I'm a financial organization, well, I happen to know that the Lazarus Group are very, very often interested in attacking financial organizations. Ir irrespective of size or, or importance, they love going after financial institutions. Brilliant. What kind of tactics and techniques are they vulnerable to, uh, are they likely to use? Okay, now let's take a step back and map that to what my infrastructure looks like. Where are my weak points? I've got a relatively small attack surface area potentially, but there are going to be entry points into my network. What am I monitoring there? How am I monitoring it? And what, what potential movements could those attackers make? Before you've done any alarm configuration at all, you must go through this threat modeling exercise. Uh, something I'd strongly recommend uh, leveraging sort of third party um, outside help to potentially give you visibility that you would maybe be blind to otherwise and give you um, ideas as to what you might be negative, uh, you might be negatively affected by that again, you might be blind to as, as someone who owns and manages that environment. Once you've done that threat modeling, you then need to look into creating customized playbooks that in will enable your teams to respond consistently and effectively. There's no use monitoring for those threats if you don't tell your analysts how to respond when they do when they when a threat arrives. And why do I say that? Well, we all know that the biggest problem with SOC visibility and security monitoring in general is the lack of resources, of lack of people available to do these sorts of things. If you don't deliver customized playbooks and, and standardized playbooks for your, for your individual threats, you're relying on the skill sets of your analysts to respond to those threats. What happens when that analyst leaves? What happens when you bring in junior analysts and you expect them to respond in the same way as your senior analyst? That's just not going to happen. Consistency in response delivers speed of response and it also delivers training to those younger, less, less experienced security analysts so that they can improve over time. By doing this and by creating this idea of uh, leveraging your senior analyst leaders as, as the people who build this content, you're developing a constant feedback loop of training and, and enablement within the team that's only going to help your team grow over time, but is also going to slowly build up a much more consistent security baseline than if you just tried to deploy everything at once. I also think it's really important to not just look away from sort of standardized good practice frameworks and, and industry knowledge. There's a lot of great detail out there. There's a lot of people trying to help and trying to provide you with the kind of help you need to get to a point where you've got that baseline security visibility. But I'm also really cognizant of not just diving in and assuming that everything that uh, NIST tells me is right for me or everything that the MITRE framework tells me to look for is right for me. These, these frameworks are not one, five, one size fits all and you should be developing them in line with what you need. Finally, on process, and, and it goes back to the idea of don't use a kitchen sink approach. I'm a massive believer in a Japanese term called Kaizen, something I've um, worked with as a, as a principal within SOC um, visibility and SOC delivery for pretty much the entire time I've been doing it. And I, I talked about this um, at a presentation a few months ago and got rather um, a rude awakening by a chap who was there when I said that um, Kaizen comes from a, ja a Japanese term from Toyota of consistent service improvement and small improvements and never stopping that improvement. So building slowly, slowly, slowly by constantly doing small incremental improvements. And I said that it was a Japanese term and a, and a Japanese, um, Japanese process. And he said, actually, Jake, this actually was taken over to Japan by the Americans back, uh, back in the early 90s. And the guys within the Toyota factory leveraged an American style to build this Kaizen framework. 
The point is, if you're looking to build a security process framework within your security monitoring strategy, small, consistent improvements. Don't necessarily expect to do everything all at once. You're better off with 10 very well-defined alarms and playbooks aligned to them than you are a thousand alarms with no playbooks aligned. So you've got the process down. Now let's look at people. So what, what, are we, what are we doing from a people perspective to ensure that we have a response in an appropriate manner when an incident occurs? Well, the good news is this one's relatively settled from a security monitoring hierarchy perspective. There's gen, the general be best practice is seen as sort of three or four levels of, of, of triage, of um, analyst rather. The first level, your level ones are your, tri are your triage analysts. The big thing to note here is that level one analysts do not stay level, level one analysts for long. If they're good, they'll want to do more. If they're not good, they won't want to be in the security monitoring industry for long. So you need to be looking to constantly improve and, 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 and monitor your level one analysts to ensure that they know where they can go next. If they don't spot signs for improvement, believe me, they will find another organization that will give them that exit point, give them that, uh, that place to go. Once they've done that initial triage and they've and they've ensured they've got rid of a lot of the false positives that are potentially flying around an environment, you're then onto your level two analysts. These are the really the day to day analysts. These are the guys who are going to be doing a lot of your investigations and a lot of your initial response framework. So uh, responding to basic attacks, basic potential mitigation factors, really the bread and butter of everything that is security monitoring and SOC visibility. And then you've got your level three slash level four. So. Um, level threes are obviously just senior experienced security analysts that are available for escalation. But also, these are guys that you're freeing up to do two really crucial things. The first is threat hunting. You're leveraging their security skills to go out and find threats that aren't visible to any alarms or any uh, reports that you've created within the environment. And the second the idea of tool creation. Now, tool creation could be a specific dedicated tool that they create that does a, some flashy thing for your analyst team. But it could be as simple as, as I talked about earlier, that idea of customized playbook creation. So getting your level four to say, right, Joe Blogs, tell me how you would respond to this incident in real time. Okay, I'll do these steps. Right, write that down, push that down to my level twos and my level ones. Now, Mr. Level four analyst, you don't have to do that anymore. That's been pushed down. We're pushing down the capabilities to as low a level as possible, freeing up the time for our level threes and level fours to do what they do best, which is proactive threat monitoring and threat hunting. The second thing to remember, though, when you're talking about analytics and you're talking about the SOC visibility triad and how it, how it can be built for a security monitoring team is that specialist tools require specialists with specific skill sets. Don't assume that just because your SOC uh, is stocked with a group of SIEM analysts who are fantastic at looking at log data, that you can throw a network detection tool in there and they're going to know how it works. We were deploying a proof of value um, earlier this year, and me and the head of the SOC, who was a SIEM guy, much like myself, were going through the um, results of the proof of value, and we, we were finding things, and we created a, a two-page report of the kind of things we'd found that we wanted to share with, with the customer. And uh, he said to me, well, I've just got this guy coming in. I've just hired a guy who's a network security specialist by trade. And he'd like to sort of jump in with us, have a look at what we found and see if he can help us find anything else. And, and we said, and I said, yeah, fine. I'd love to learn. Really interesting. So the guy came onto a call with us. We sat down and we went through. He changed that two-page report into a 15-page report. And he pulled, pulled up five core items that should be flagged to the customer immediately, either their things that shouldn't be happening on the environment that they're allowing legitimately that need to be stopped or their malicious activity that needs to be cold straight away. And I, I was sort of gobsmacked by just what he'd done. And I, and I asked him sort of, why why have, were you able to spot so much more than me? What, what, what were you doing that was different to what I was doing? And he asked me a really strange question for a security professional. He said, Jake, do you know the OSI model? And I said, well, yeah, of course, like everyone's done their CCNA at this point in their life. And um, yeah, I know the OSI model. I could tell you the different layers, not a problem. And he said, no, do you know it? Do you know intimately the different layers and, and how they interact and what potential threats could be put into each of those different layers during an attack? And I said, well, no, I work in logs. Like 
I, I think it's fair to say I've let my skills within network visibility atrophy over time because it's not something I've needed. And he said, well, that's the point. If you want to be a network security and a network visibility specialist, those sorts of skills are core to everything I do. Understanding the kinds of protocols and the kind of um, changes that can be made to a packet is fundamental to me being able to spot threats on a network. So really the key here is to inventory what you have, understand what your analysts can and cannot do and provide them with tools and training to get them to a point where they can respond to threats based on the, based on the capabilities you've given them. And then finally, don't get hung up on the fact that there's always another threat coming. If you expect your analysts to only learn via on-the-job training, their skills will absolutely atrophy. 90% of the skills, 90% uh, of the alerts and the alarms that they respond to will not test them in the slightest. You as a leader are responsible for challenging and developing every individual in your team, whether that be through constantly pushing them to be more, do more complex and more interesting things, or whether that be, that be don't rest on your laurels, Joe Blogs, go out, do this course, do this comp TIA course, do this um, uh, threat modeling course, do this threat research course. Develop their skills, because if you develop their skills, you're going to develop your SOC as a whole. And then finally, partners. So um, I know a lot of people call this people, process, and tools. Um, we've obviously talked about the tools at the top. And um, what I wanted to talk about here was the idea of partnership and partnering with different members, um, different organizations, both internally and externally. The crucial point is, when it comes to security visibility and security monitoring, there is no single silver bullet. Whether that be Logarithm saying they are or whether that be another organization, there is no single organization that's going to give you all the visibility you need across every part of your environment. You absolutely need to rely on multiple tools and partners working in unison so that you can get the holistic visibility you're looking for. And what that means is when you're looking for tool adoption, you're looking for partnership adoption, you should be selecting as much on compatibility as you are as capability. If, for instance, you have a logarithm SIM as the core part of your visibility infrastructure, when you're deciding on what threat intelligence vendor to use or what breach attack simulation vendor to use, one of the questions you should be asking is, how does that work with my existing security monitoring strategy? Does it integrate with my scene tool? If it doesn't, why doesn't it? How can I get that integration to work? Is it going to be a force multiplier for what I'm doing within my security visibility, or is it going to create more work and detract from it? And be realistic. I talked earlier about the idea that the biggest problem within the security monitoring industry is lack of expertise, lack of analyst availability. Well, Acknowledge if that's if that's your reality. If you if you're an organization who has two people who one of you is the CISO and the next one down is the head of security, well, maybe you don't have the resources to do a full SOC visibility, uh, a full security monitoring strategy that relies on you responding to every threat that comes in. Particularly within the security monitoring space, the past 10 years have seen a massive sea change in the way that we deliver security monitoring out of our outsource and MSSP partners, in that they they can they're much more flexible and they're much more willing to build an environment that will work for you. Don't desperately try to hang on to internal security monitoring strategy if the business aren't going to invest in the people and the processes needed to do it effectively. And then finally, I, I talked about the SOC visibility triad at the start as a great foundation for security visibility. But the fact is, it's a start and it's not the be all and end all. Threat intelligence, whether that be open source technologies such as MISP or whether that be uh, more expensive paid for technologies like recorded futures, is a force multiplier across all three of the different pillars of the SOC visibility triad. Being able to leverage quickly and easily understanding of what IPs are and are not malicious without having to go in and do uh, long investigations into specifically what different IPs do is absolutely a, a speed enhancer for everything you do from a response perspective. And as we've moved to a much more distributed world, firstly, with the advent of cloud computing being sort of the way the world has gone, but then probably more recently, the, the COVID um, pandemic and everyone moving to working from home, there's been a proliferation in the need for identity and access management and privileged access management tool sets. So don't rest on your laurels and say, we've got our three tool sets, we're good to go. 
Look at what else you can do as a force multiplier to give you more visibility and give you more control over what's going on in your network. Crucially, though, I just want to go very back up to it. That, that third line in the first in the first paragraph, select based on compatibility and capability. If you're just based, if you're just buying tools that are the best of breed that don't interact together, essentially what you're doing is creating more work for the individual members of your team. And that is my whistle stop tour through developing a security monitoring strategy. Um, happy to answer any questions if there are any. Um, I don't see any in the chat right now, but um, I'll give it uh, 30 seconds and please do ask them if, you, if you've got them. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for watching. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Okay, we have we haven't had any questions come in. Uh, a very a very nice comment. Thank you very much to the person who wrote the comment. Oh, can you talk a little bit more about how the logarithm NDR deals with encrypted traffic? So um, I think the big thing to talk about when it comes to um, encrypted traffic is understanding JA3 fingerprinting. And to be honest with you, going into JA3 fingerprinting in the time I've got left wouldn't really be wouldn't really be sensible. But what I would suggest is, is just go, going on to Google, to be quite frank, and typing in what is JA3 fingerprinting. Or indeed, if you if you want us to go through it with you, feel free to reach out to myself or your logarithm SE, and they'll be happy to talk you through it. Effectively, what we're doing with JA3 fingerprinting is acknowledging that we can't see the content of a packet, but what we can see are things such as directionality and um, and the, the speed with which that, or the, the velocity with which that traffic is moving. Once we know that kind of information, we can then leverage machine learning to say, is this normal for this kind of for this kind of traffic, even if it's encrypted? Because obviously we know the host that it's come from as well. So by doing that and by leveraging the bits of information we can get, we're still able to deliver a lot of value out of monitoring encrypted traffic. The one bit you do lose when you're trying to monitor encrypted traffic using things like JA3 fingerprinting is you don't get... Uh, those deterministic style rules, which are looking for specific patterns within a, within a piece of packet data. But to be honest with you, from my perspective, that's a price worth paying to ensure that uh, network visibility and network security are kept at the same level of prioritization. Brilliant. Um, and yeah, that seems to be all the questions. Um, as I say, this will be available to you um, on demand if you want to come back and look at it again. If in the meantime, you've got any other questions, uh, please reach out to your logarithm representative or feel free to shoot me a message or even indeed give me a call. I'll be happy to help.